Amoebiasi, also known as amoebic dysentery, is a parasitic infection caused by the protozoan parasite into amoeba histolytica. This parasite is responsible for a range of gastrointestinal symptoms and can lead to severe illness if left untreated. Early recognition of symptoms is crucial for appropriate diagnosis and prompt treatment. Diarrhea is a hallmark symptom of amoebiosis. It typically presents as loose, watery stools that may be frequent and accompanied by an urgent need to defecate. The diarrhea can range from mild to severe. As the parasite burrows into the intestinal lining, it can cause inflammation and irritation. This irritation triggers an increased production of mucus by the intestinal cells as a protective response. The excessive production of mucus is the body's way of attempting to protect the intestinal lining from further damage and irritation caused by the invading amoeba. This mucus often mixes with the stool and is passed during bowel movements. In addition to mucus, amoebiasis can also cause blood to appear in the stool. This happens because the parasite can create ulcers in the intestinal wall, leading to bleeding. The combination of blood and mucus in the stool is a classic sign of amoebic dysentery, a more severe form of amoebiasis. Abdominal pain in amoebiasis is typically described as cramping and discomfort in the lower abdominal area. It can vary in intensity and may come and go. The pain can occur in any area of the abdomen. It may be associated with a feeling of fullness or bloating. The abdominal pain is primarily a result of the inflammation and irritation caused by the amoebic parasites in the intestinal lining. Entamoeba histolytica has a particular affinity for the large intestine, where it can cause significant inflammation and damage. Some individuals may experience nausea and vomiting, although it is less common than diarrhea. The severity of nausea and vomiting can vary. Some individuals may experience mild, occasional nausea, while others may have more intense bouts of vomiting, especially if the infection is severe. It is often triggered by severe gastrointestinal distress and irritation caused by the infection. In some cases of amoebiosis, individuals may develop a fever. The fever is usually low-grade, with temperatures ranging from 37.8 to 38.9 degrees Celsius. It's important to note that not everyone with amoebiosis will experience a fever. The fever associated with amoebiosis is usually not persistent but may come and go along with other symptoms. The duration and severity of the fever can vary from person to person. In some cases, amoebiosis can become chronic, meaning the infection persists for an extended period. Chronic amoebiosis can lead to persistent symptoms, including fatigue. This is often due to the body's ongoing efforts to fight the infection and the strain on the body caused by diarrhea and nutrient loss. Chronic diarrhea, a common symptom of amoebiosis, can lead to malabsorption causing weakness and fatigue due to inadequate nutrient intake. In severe cases of amoebiosis, the parasite can damage the lining of the intestines. This damage can impair the body's ability to absorb nutrients from food properly. When nutrients aren't absorbed efficiently, it can lead to malnutrition and weight loss. Also, the associated diarrhea and decreased appetite can ultimately result in weight loss. Diarrhea caused by amoebiosis is typically watery and can lead to substantial fluid loss in a short amount of time. This can result in dehydration, which is characterized by symptoms such as increased thirst, dry mouth, dark yellow urine, and decreased urine output. In addition, diarrhea and vomiting caused by amoebiosis can also lead to the loss of essential electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride. An electrolyte imbalance can further exacerbate dehydration and lead to symptoms like weakness, dizziness, and muscle cramps. In more severe cases, the amoeba may invade the liver, leading to a liver abscess. Symptoms of a liver abscess can include pain in the upper right abdomen, fever, and jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin and eyes. Amoebiosis is most commonly spread through the fecal oral route, which means that the infection is transmitted when a person ingests the cysts of the parasite that have been passed in the feces of an infected individual. The most common way people contract amoebiosis is by consuming food or water contaminated with the cysts of Entamoeba histolytica. This can happen if food is prepared or handled by an infected person who hasn't practiced proper hand hygiene after using the toilet. Eating raw or undercooked seafood, vegetable, or other food items that have been contaminated with Entamoeba histolytica cysts can introduce the parasite into the digestive system. In areas with inadequate sanitation facilities or poor hygiene practices, the risk of amoebiosis transmission is higher. 
Contaminated water sources and improper disposal of feces can lead to the spread of the parasite. Person-to-person -person transmission can occur when there is direct contact with the feces of an infected individual. This is especially common in areas with crowded living conditions with inadequate hygiene practices such as those in refugee camps or slums or even in childcare settings. Travelers to regions with high amoebiosis prevalence may be at an increased risk if they consume contaminated food or water. It's essential to practice good hygiene and drink safe water when traveling to such areas. Individuals with weakened immune systems, such as those with HIV and AIDS, or those taking immunosuppressive medications, are more susceptible to severe forms of amoebiosis. The parasite can spread beyond the intestines and cause liver abscesses or other complications in these cases. Young children are more vulnerable to amoebiosis due to their immature immune systems and a higher likelihood of putting contaminated objects or hands in their mouths. Understanding the pathophysiology of amoebiosis is essential for comprehending how this parasite causes disease in the human body. Here's an overview of the pathophysiology of amoebiosis. Ingested cysts release trophozoites, which invade the intestinal lining, causing symptoms and disease. Trophozoites damage the intestinal mucosa, leading to ulcers, inflammation, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and bloody stools. Trophozoites can enter the bloodstream, often reaching the liver and forming abscesses, causing severe symptoms. The immune system reacts to the parasite but may not eliminate it entirely, leading to persistence or chronic infection. Some cases result in long-term, intermittent infections, either symptomatic or asymptomatic. Trophozoites can cause liver abscesses and rarely affect other organs, leading to severe complications. Treatment can resolve amoebiosis, providing partial immunity against reinfection, though not always complete or long-lasting. The initial step in diagnosis involves a thorough medical history and physical examination by a healthcare provider. They will inquire about symptoms such as diarrhea, abdominal pain, and travel history to endemic regions. Microscopic examination of stool samples is the most common laboratory test for amoebiosis. The presence of entamoeba histolytic cysts or trophozoites in the stool confirms the infection. Stool samples may be collected on multiple days because cysts and trophozoites may not be consistently shed in the feces. Blood tests can detect antibodies to Entamoeba histolytica. These serologic tests are useful for diagnosing extraintestinal amoebiosis, such as liver abscess, and can also aid in confirming the infection in cases where stool examination results are inconclusive. In cases of suspected liver abscesses, imaging studies such as ultrasound, computed tomography, or magnetic resonance imaging may be used to visualize the abscess and assess its size and location. Invasive procedures like colonoscopy may be performed to directly visualize the intestinal lining and obtain biopsies for laboratory analysis. This is particularly useful when amoebiosis is suspected but stool tests are negative. PCR tests can detect the DNA of Entamoeba histolytica in stool samples, providing a highly specific and sensitive diagnostic method. PCR is especially useful when accurate diagnosis is critical. Antigen detection tests can identify specific antigens of Entamoeba histolytica in stool samples, providing a rapid and accurate diagnosis. The choice of treatment depends on the severity of the infection and whether it is intestinal or extraintestinal. In cases of uncomplicated amoebic colitis, the most commonly prescribed drug is metronidazole. Tinidazole is an alternative. For severe cases or extraintestinal infections, a combination of metronidazole or tinidazole with paramomycin or diloxanide furote is often used. This combination is used to treat both the invasive trophozoite form in the tissues and the cyst form in the intestine. Antispasmodic medications and analgesics may be prescribed to manage abdominal pain and cramping. Rehydration is crucial for individuals with diarrhea to prevent dehydration. Oral rehydration solutions or intravenous fluids may be necessary. In cases of large or complicated liver abscesses, drainage may be required. This can be done through aspiration or percutaneous drainage guided by imaging techniques. After completing treatment, Follow-up stool examinations may be necessary to confirm the absence of the parasite and ensure successful eradication. This is particularly important in extraintestinal cases. Amoebiosis can lead to severe complications if left untreated or if the infection spreads. 
These complications include extraintestinal amoebiosis affecting other organs, abscess formation in the liver or lungs, peritonitis from a ruptured intestinal wall, and colon complications like megacolon or toxic dilation. Preventing amoebiosis is possible through simple yet effective measures. Practice good hygiene, including hand washing. Consume safe, clean water and food. Avoid contact with contaminated water bodies. Use safe sanitation facilities. Seek medical advice before traveling to endemic regions. And that's all for this video. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with others who might benefit from this information. Subscribe to our channel for more educational content on health-related topics. Thank you for watching. Until next time.